You ever been to a fun house, that fun house mirror? You know that wavy mirror, you remember that? And you go in front of it. Remember when you were a kid for the first time, you're like, Dad, look at this mirror. This is crazy, right? And your legs get really big or your head gets really big. And you're like, whoa, this is wild, right? And your proportions get off. Trauma, pain, loss, or the perception of loss has a way of affecting our proportions. And I wonder if you and I have lost a little bit of proportion, the scale or size of something in relationship to the whole. Proportion is akin to perspective. Your proportion gets off, your perspective gets off, your view of yourself gets off, your view of your world gets off, your view of your loved one gets off, your view of your career gets off, your view of your pain gets off, your view of your pleasure gets off, your view of your success gets off, your view of your defeat gets off because you've lost touch with proportion. One of my dad's favorite statements is, son, the world doesn't revolve around you. Right? And that's a proportion statement. My dad's trying to tell me, I know all you think about is you, and all you live with is you, and you think you is the most important you on earth, but it's not, son. You're not the only person in pain. You're not the only person in the room. You've got to get some perspective. You've got to reconnect with proportion. Are your proportions off? Now, in a moment, I'm going to tell you why this is important because I think it affects us dramatically. There is an ancient psalm that David says, he says, Lord, lift me up on a rock that is higher than myself. I need you to lift me up. I need a new vista. I need a new perspective. I need to look with fresh eyes. Am I the only one that's lost some friends during COVID? Just lost touch? So many people have moved on. Even our staff at church has changed so much. I got a text from a pastor in route about probably 30, 40 minutes ago. He said, man, can you send me something funny? Can you send me a golf video? I just got out of the most heated staff meeting of all time. I got so many disgruntled staff members in our church staff, and I'm hurt, and I'm in pain. And I said, you are not alone. I'm telling you, the church isn't exempt employees, owners, managers, leaders, there is an upheaval, there is an unsettling. People are, like I said, are thinking about changing their career. Is this right? Am I valued? Am I seen? Am I important? I don't know. And as a result, we, I think if we're not careful, we can lose perspective. Oh, proportion and perspective are far more important than you realize, and they're essential to your health. They're essential to your overall well-being. Now, some of you are really good at proportion when it comes to pain. Some of you are really good in proportion when it comes to success and pleasure. Very few people, I find, have proportion and perspective on both. Meaning some people, when everything is going well, they're like, God is so good. He is so gracious. All of life is a gift. God just keeps blessing me everywhere I go. Blessing after blessing after blessing. It's a whole new world, right? It's like, oh my word, Jesus, yes, right? And they seem to have such a firm grip on perspective and proportion. God just keeps blessing me. One afternoon, things seem to turn. Boss says, we don't have any more money to pay you. Going to have to let, let you go. I started this business with you. I, I, I'm going to have to let you go. Who do you think you are? And all of a sudden, unexpected interruptions to your regularly scheduled program, which is another word for pain, changes pain. By the way, some are like, there's so much change. That's another way of saying there's so much pain. And as a result, a lot of people, when pain is introduced to them, they start to lose. Is there a God? I doubt it. I used to love him in the 90s. Some of you weren't born. Never mind. That doesn't work anymore. I got to really change that. Mid-2000s, the early 20s, you know, whatever. But we lose proportion. Some people, it's inverted. When things are going well, they're like, well, any minute now, something bad's probably going to happen, you know. Knock on wood. 
here it goes. You know, I don't like when things are going too good. I got friends who literally, this is what they say. When things are going too good, I, don't feel, I feel unsettled. <laughs> it's not good. But when there's struggle, when there's pain, come on, you know some of these people. It's like pain and struggle is their brand. Yeah, I shouldn't be here. But I'm here. <laughs> say something. Right? I'm a world beater. And you're like, man, that is super awesome. But even the pain has lost proportion, perspective. I want to take us to a story tonight that really, it's outrageous, and it really speaks to this incredible dynamic that's at play. But before we do, I want to say this. The problem with losing proportion, which causes you to lose perspective, is typically what results is a lot of stress, Fear, worry, and striving. What is striving? Striving is when you assume the captaincy of the ship of your life. Striving is when you become the superhero of your own story. And boy, is that great when all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and everything is going well in life and you just can't wait to do a TED Talk and write a book and tell everyone why you're so successful. Until COVID hits. And then it's, where is God? And, right, we, 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 and the problem with proportion and perspective, when you lose it, you feel like if it's meant to be, it's up to me. It's up to me. Now, some of you, I love you so much, but you, like, you have that quote somewhere. Take it down as fast as you can. The title of my message tonight, you'll be shocked, is you need to hurry. And I'll explain. You need to hurry. You need to hurry. You don't have any more time to waste with a misappropriation, with a, with a disproportionate perspective of yourself and life. But I got good news. Where we're going to go is we're going to begin to understand that when coming in contact with the divine, you begin to sober up. You get some sanity, no longer drunk on circumstances. Am I the only one that just drinks in all of my circumstances and my circumstances seem to be the zenith of all truth? If all is well, I am well. If all is not well, I am not well. And some of you think that's just normal. I got good news tonight. I have a story to tell you to introduce you to a whole different way of living that actually... The Bible says you can be grateful in all circumstances. You can rejoice in all seasons. You can actually learn proportion and perspective can begin to serve you rather than you serving it. Whether you're in pain, whether you're in pleasure, whether you're enjoying incredible success or overwhelming defeat and loss, Let's reconnect tonight to proportion and perspective. You need to hurry. You need to hurry. You have not one more day to waste without the proportion and perspective that God has for you. That brings us to one of my favorite characters right now, and I, I honestly, some of you have heard me talk about him, and I'm going to talk more because I'm seeing things I've never seen before. And it's this man by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Now, if you grew up in church, I hope that name triggers a song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. I love this church so much because this is the only one you've ever been in, clearly. <laughs> and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's okay. <clears throat> I love you. I had two wonderful, kind ladies right over here. I saw you. I saw you. Just, you, were, you were like, see what he can see. And I scanned the room, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> um, Zacchaeus was not a good guy. He robbed his own Jewish people of uh, money. He was a tax collector from Rome. He was a traitor. You've heard me get a give a little bit of his context. Uh, very quickly, uh, Rome was having great challenge in taxing the Jewish people. There was uh, gross uh, oppression and marginalization by Rome in relationship to Israel and the Jews. 
Uh, it was uh, not healthy. It was not a good relationship. And when it came to collecting taxes from the Jews for Rome, that got very frustrated and heated. So Rome got a great idea. Let's actually find Jewish men who will work for us, Rome, who will go door to door to their own people and get taxes for our country. But what we'll tell them is you can add to the tax as much as you want and you can pocket the money. So that's Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, which means he's been doing it a long time and he's so good at it, he trains other Jewish people to cheat their own people out of their own money. Now, you think to yourself, well, I mean, that's you know, good for people to pay some money. No, no, listen, he, he's going to little old ladies' houses, talking about, I know you got change in your couch. Go get it and give it to me. This is not a good man. And that's going to be really important in the story because if you think the relationship with Jesus is depending on your performance or whether or not you've ever stolen something or whether or not you're living a lie or whether or not your whole career is an absolute fraud and you think because of that you shouldn't even be in church, this is your story. Zacchaeus hears the rumblings of this guy Jesus uh, for those that don't know, Jesus actually was becoming famous, truly famous in antiquity, which obviously was different because of the lack of technology, but word of mouth had spread so much that when Jesus showed up in towns and villages or even traveled, oftentimes there would be a caravan, people would come to see the miracle worker. If for nothing else, they just wanted to see if he would do something spectacular. And I think that was ultimately where Zacchaeus was. He's like, listen, man, I'm a, I'm a guy. I'm a guy that likes to get in the mix and hang out a little bit. And I heard this guy's pretty cool. So he's like, man, I'm going to check him out. But he realizes he's short, right? Now, it's funny because New, the New Testament could record a number of different stories, but the stories it does record all points us back to who we are and who Jesus is. And the Bible says we're all short spiritually, we all don't measure up spiritually. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. So really Zacchaeus in what is Luke chapter 19 is a portrait and picture of humanity. The truth is, and you may not like this part of my story, you and I are Zacchaeus. Judah, I never cheated anybody out of money. Yeah, but you cheated somebody some way, somehow. If not just yourself. So we are Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus has this idea, I need to see Jesus. Now, there are people here tonight in this auditorium, or I should say this theater, and they're here tonight, and you are here tonight because you want to look into this Jesus guy. And the only misnomer that I'd like to correct almost immediately, and I do this with all respect, due respect to you who are here for the very first time. Maybe you've never even been to church. I started that singing that Zacchaeus song, and you're like, what is that? What, 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 where's that from? Is that an iPhone commercial? What's that? And, and, and you know not, and, and, and you're like, I, I, I want to maybe be a religious person. I want to be maybe one of them Christian people. And I just want to hear, like, what do I got to do? Like, who do I got to be? How much is this preacher going to tell me I got to give up? Because life's hard right now, and I could, use, I could use a little bit of God in my life, so, but I'm going to kind of assess what I got to do to be in with God. I would only say that your premise, it will mislead you. What I'm about to try to articulate and communicate is the message and the news that is so good is that you cannot earn, deserve, or warrant, or garner God's attention through your morality or through your elitism or through your wisdom or understanding. We are not here for a, mental, a, a mere mental ascent. I am not here as much knowledge. The more knowledge you get, you'll be closer to God. No, in fact, the Bible says more knowledge can just make you more arrogant. So the, the goal isn't just knowledge. That is statistics, stories, and facts. It's that you know God. If God is God, I want to know him. He's a person. He's not an alien. He's a person. The Bible says you and I were made in his image. So I want to know him. I got good news. You and I were Zacchaeus. We're short. You know what we think about all the time? How am I going to get God's attention? That's what Zacchaeus thought. So he said, I'll tell you what I do. I'm going to climb a sycamore tree. If you're familiar with sycamore trees, they got low-hanging limbs, easy for even short people to climb. So he finds a sycamore tree, and he climbed up the sycamore tree. And wouldn't you believe it? Here came the caravan. He could see the dust building in the distance, and he had projected that Jesus would most, most likely, almost surely, walk by this way because this is the pathway and this is the road. And I picked the perfect little sycamore tree right next to the road, and I'm just sure I'm going to get a wonderful view of Jesus. And this basically defines for many people what they call Christianity. 
I'm going to go to church, I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to give money. I'm going to find a tree, climb it, and I'm going to impress God. And most preachers don't know it, but their sermons, I should say some preachers don't know it, but their sermons teach you to climb up. I'm here to preach you sermons that tell you to climb down. We're going to climb down tonight. You're going to get out of your proverbial tree that you think gets you closer to God. I got good news. Your virginity doesn't get you any closer to God. Now, I recommend that you stay a virgin unless you're married. Please have sex. Now, a lot of people are like, Judah, I'm having sex and I'm not married. It's at the end of the world. No, it's not the end of the world. Jesus forgives. He's amazing. That's incredible. But think about it. It's not productive. It's not, I, honestly, I have never met the person. I really haven't. I've never met the person that one time. I'm 43 years young. I have never met the man who's like, man, I have so much sex with so many people. My life just keeps improving. <laughs> Do you know of anyone who would also like to have sexual relations to me? Because the more people... I never met him. It's just not the way God set it up. We just, we keep, we keep, something kind of hurts, something kind of aches. We say it doesn't. Come on, we say it doesn't. Man, I don't care, man, please. <laughs> That's why you keep saying that, by the way, because you care so much. It's called deflection. It's very normal. But we think we can just, <laughs> I had a married guy recently said, yeah, me and my wife, we smash at 7.30. I was like, yo, bro, I don't know <laughs> like, you've been married 17 years, bro. You talking about smashing at 7.30? Can we drop the smash and the 7.30? Like, you need to do that at 5.30. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, you know, I'm 43, you know. Ah, Chelsea and I, we wait till 9.45, <laughs> quarter to 10. Like, I start giving you our time, you know, like, bro, relax. Oh, man, I love you guys. Let's pray. God, you know, <laughs> Does he normally leave things undone? <laughs> but <laughs> we think that our morality, we, we think that our knowledge, we think that our good deeds, we think that our actions, like a tree, garner God's attention. And so we climb trees. I found that I can start off not in a tree at the beginning of the day, but by the end of the day, I climbed up in the tree, and I'm like, I'm trying. Do you see me? And then it's like the end of the day comes, and I'm all stressed, and I'm anxious, and I'm gripping the sycamore tree. And I'm like, do you see me? I'm really being a good guy down here. I'm not like the other pastors. I only sleep with my wife. You know, like, please, God, right? Like, and. Oh, you guys need to come more. That, we, 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 we talk about that stuff here. So we're like, oh, I can't believe he said that. Really? Okay, so. But I do. Sometimes I do feel like, God, you must really want to bless me because I don't sleep with people I'm not married to. And I'm just telling you, God's not in heaven going, that's it, Judah. So proud of you, man. And I think he wants that, and that's the gift I want to give my wife, frankly. So if I didn't even know Jesus, I just told Chelsea, I was like, I, I just want you, I want to be with you, and I want to give this for the rest of my life, I just want to be with you. That's my goal, I'm gonna work hard at it, um, and, and, and that's that. So come and see me in 20 years, I'm still gonna be smashing, no, I'm not gonna say smash. <laughs> that's the worst. I don't know, man, married at a certain point, smash is just, it's not it. Okay, so I think we should just go with making love. I think that works for me. Okay. Sex is all my mind. I tell you what. Um, so, so he, he somebody it really hit him late. They're just like, oh, this guy's crazy. <laughs> all right. So we climb trees, don't we? Am I the only one late at night? I'm all just, do you know what I mean by you're on the climb, striving, anxious, you are the captain of your ship, right? You are the commander in chief of your destiny. And you're in that tree and you're like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. Do people understand me? Do people respect me? Do people appreciate me? Do they know what I'm doing? Like, right, these are all symptoms of climbing, right? Do people realize the trees that I climb for them? Look at all these, no one, do they see? I am climbing 
Where, I, do you know how many trees I've been climbing as a pastor? I've been doing this for 23 years. No one sees me at all. I'm trying so hard. But God, I, I know you see me. And that's why you've blessed me. Here's climb talk. If you stay on the straight and narrow, young man, God will bless you. Old ladies in the church have been telling us that for years. They mean well, but they're wrong. You think the blessing of God is based on the straight and narrow? Spell straight and narrow really fast. Like, no, no, it's not. Like, you don't even know. What? Straight and narrow. The Bible says that, that while we were still sinners, the greatest blessing of God was offered to us. Jesus died for us when we didn't even know there was a straight or a narrow. He died for us. So this isn't predicated on your performance, but what we keep doing, oftentimes because we lose concept, we're like proportion. There's, I don't know where God is. He seems a million miles away. I guess I'm God of my own life, and if it's meant to be, it's up to me. And so you get in what you put out, or you, you get out what you put in, and, and I'm on the grind, and I'm going to do this. And Every time we get together at the Saban, I feel like I'm doing the same thing. I'm just trying to take all the luggage of your personal performance and lack of proportion and telling you, you are not in control. You're like the guy or the gal in 25C acting like you're driving the plane. Yeah, all right. You know, I mean, you're like the guy who, he, you know, stands up in the plane like, we're going to be going over San Diego. We're going to make a quick stop over Sacramento, and we're going to bring it in. It'll probably be a two-and-a-half-hour flight. Everyone stay put. Please buckle up. Everyone's like, dude, you're, you're a passenger like us. Sit down. Nah, nah, I'm a big flyer. What? You're not a pilot. You're not in charge. But we're in 25C telling everybody we're driving the plane. And everyone's like, but you're not. No, I am. No, you're not even like the controls are a long ways away from you. You're not even close to the controls. Jesus says, are you burned out? Are you wore out? Are you exhausted? Come to me. I'll show you how to take a real rest. I'll show you how to let go. I'll show you how to lay down. He makes me lie down. He makes me. He makes me, Psalms 23 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. You need to hurry. What are you talking about, Judah? You're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. But I mean, I kind of hope you do because that's the goal. But listen, Jesus is walking, right? Remember the caravan? I haven't forgotten. And Zacchaeus is up in the tree and he's like, I, I, I got the best tree. I chose the best tree. I am so, I know how to get money. I'm wealthy. I'm infamous, which is kind of cool. And I climbed the best tree. I am the man. He's come, he's getting closer. He's, he stopped under my tree. I'm going to write a book about my tree. I'm going to preach about my tree because my tree is the key to getting God's attention. You need, to, you, need to, you, need to, you need to climb the tree I'm climbing. What's the tree? I pray and I fast. And that's how I get God's attention. And I, I'm gonna, I, I don't mean to be mean, but, but we say things like, prayer changes everything. What is happening? Prayer, ch- what am I doing? I don't know. I just got to come up with new things because I see some of you getting distracted. So I'm like, do something, do something. (laughs) I've been speaking for a long time, a lot of years. I see distracted. I'm like, do something. (sighs) He's back. He's back. So, but prayer changes things. (laughs) You know what that means? That's like you coming to me saying, Judah, do you mind driving my car home? And again, no problem. I drive your car home. And you're like, I'll tell you what changes everything. (laughs) Asking Judah to do something for you. And I'm like, my thing, I don't, what? Like, bro, you just, you didn't change anything. You just asked me. I got your car home. So it's not the conversation that changed anything. I changed it. 
So here's a better statement. God changes everything. Prayer is just connecting with God. Prayer is actually a way of saying, God, only really you are in control. So I'm just here to acknowledge that, first of all. And uh, could you help me with uh, my exam coming up here? I'm going to USC, and I've got finals coming up, and I'd really appreciate it. And then you ace the exam, you're like, prayer changes things. I'm going to write a book on how you need to pray before you take a test. I, don't, I think Jesus did that, bro. I don't think it was your prayer life. I'll tell you why I fast. Every time I fast, I get the attention of the Almighty. <laughs> Fasting's good, but eating is way better. <laughs> and any preacher who tells you otherwise is not telling you the truth. <laughs> fast or eat. Here's things preachers never tell you. Jesus had a nickname. It wasn't a good one. First one was Friends of Sinners. Here's his other nickname, Wine Bibber. Yeah, I didn't think there'd be a lot of amens. Jesus like, he's a glutton. He overeats and he drinks wine. And we're busy impressing God. I don't drink alcohol, I'm a man of God. <laughs> Dude, I think it's awesome. I really, I have lots of friends. Like, I'm never gonna be the preacher in your life who's like, you don't drink? Come on, man, drink. Like, no, I don't think that's my role. You know, like, come on, suck down a Budweiser and let's watch. You know, like, no, I don't think that's productive, but we, see, it's hard for us to understand, but there are people who think because they don't wear hats in church, they don't chew gum, they don't cuss, and they don't drink, that they've climbed a tree that all of heaven stops at and goes, wow, wow. And do you know who they voted for? Wow. Come on, bring all the angels, dark angels, all of them. <laughs> Check out this guy. I know he's four feet off the air, but act impressed. <laughs> Proportion. 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 Your act and what you did garnered God. Well, wait. So, so you, you can just kind of like manipulate things? That's a miss, that's, what's happened to proportion? You're like Louis nibbling my toes because he thinks that I only exist to play ball with him. And I look at him and I go, son, I mean Louis. <laughs> He's like a son to me. I have a life, buddy, okay? You know, but he's like, wait, well, no, your life is me. And we think our relationship with God, and so, so here's, I, we're, we're, getting, we're getting closer to the end here. So Jesus comes to the tree, right? And he, he stops right by Zacchaeus' tree and he looks up and Zacchaeus is like, I'm good. I don't have to tell you I'm good. I know where to be and how to be. I'm good. And people are looking like, that's Zacchaeus. I hate that guy. My grandma died last summer with no money because of him, right? And he's like, and Jesus goes, um, hurry. Hold on a second. Sorry. I'm so sorry, bro. That's on me, man. Is that Z-Max? That sounded like Z-Max Waters. I'm really sorry. I'm terrifying kids out here. I got to get a hold of myself, man. 43, I'm losing my touch. Kids used to love me. Oh, man. Ah! Mom, no! Don't make me go to the savant. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Do you know this is the only place Jesus ever says hurry in all of his life and ministry? In fact, I would venture to say if you put the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament together, you're hard-pressed to find any other place. I'll show you one more before this is over where God either says hurry or is ever in a hurry. God just doesn't hurry. We hurry. God doesn't. But he stops at this tree, which for us is proverbial. I hope you're following me. And he says, hurry, come down. Now, I think for some people, they'd be like, excuse me, come down from my political persuasion? I don't think so. Hurry. Hurry to tell other people to climb the same kind of tree? No. Calm down. This is ridiculous. I did this for you. 
No, you didn't. No, I, I did. I need you to not spend one more minute in that tree. I don't want you to spend one more moment in that tree, Zacchaeus. Now watch what Jesus says. Hurry and come down, for I must stay. Now this is imperative language, imperative, I must stay, which speaks of assignment. Evidently, he stopped under that tree because the father said to the son, stop here, I have a dinner date for you. It had nothing, you're not gonna like this part of the sermon, but you will if you understand it relieves pressure. You think God stopped at your tree because you climbed it. He stopped at your tree because that was the divine assignment, because he chooses you and he loves you. And by the way, a lot of people don't like it when Jesus stops at your tree, especially if you don't seem to deserve it. Hey, why do they have a nice job? I've never seen them fast for 21 days at the beginning of the new year. <laughs> why do they? Hurry and come down. Elizabeth says, I must stay at your house today. Do you see what God values and what we value? We value trees, accomplishment, climbing, morality, legalism, escapism. I won't get into it. You know what Jesus values? I want to come to your house with you. And we're like, we'll have other time to drink and eat, Jesus. We're trying to change the world. <laughs> come on up here and see what I'm saying. <laughs> we're so myopic, aren't we? Or is that just me? Am I the only person that like listens to historical figures and go, oh, that's nice. But their life wasn't as real and important as mine. And then you're like, or maybe it was. And you're like, oh, I guess I'm just a part of, yeah, the whole picture. And you're, we're busy. Like, I'm just, I'm tired. I'm tired of the climb. Are you tired of the climb? I'm tired. Jesus says, woe to the man who gains the whole world, climbs the tallest trees in the village, in the towns, in the cities, in the countries he or she lives in. You climb tall trees that even men step back and say, wow, you're the goat. <laughs> you're the goat, man. And you go, thanks. And that's it. <laughs> that's all you get. You're the goat, bro. And then you get old. Yeah, you get old. I was watching the Australian Open the other night. This is on late at night, and I'm up late praying. <laughs> and uh, uh, and some old tennis legends were sitting in the stands. And Chelsea goes, wow. Like one, one tennis legend looks like he's on the verge of eternity. You know what I mean? It's like, ooh, close to God. <laughs> and Chelsea goes, you die young. That's not very fun. Or you just get old. That's not fun either. I was like, all right, good talk. Thanks, babe. <laughs> How many trees are you going to climb? How many people will you need to be impressed? How many people have to come around your tree, your Instagram posts, and tell you how great you are? Until you're fulfilled and happy. And we think, what we've done, see, with proportion and perspective, the reason it's so off is we have included the divine in our own making, and we believe that the divine is American. We believe that the divine is a type A. We believe that the divine is an accomplisher. We believe that the divine is all about the here and now. We believe the divine cares only about planet Earth. We believe the divine is all about now. And so the divine must be in cahoots with like everybody else, and I must be recognized and loved and appreciated based on my performance, my deeds, my success, accomplishments, and resume, right? And the divine comes by your tree and says, you need to hurry. One more day is only going to hurt you. Come down. If I come down from my tree, though, my tree's kind of been my thing. What are we going to do? Go to your house for dinner. Really? Now, Zacchaeus was pretty happy because he's like, man, we're going to. Jesus is coming to my house, right? Now, 
These are parts of the story that are very hard for us to grasp and understand, but what ended up happening was an enormous amount of gossip broke out like you wouldn't believe. You want to talk about cancel culture. They, there are people that wrote Jesus off right at this moment because they're like, if you go to eat with someone like that, you are no Messiah to me, sir, because that man is a thief. He says, come on, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. I mean, Zacchaeus, how many know Zacchaeus? When he came down off that tree, he wasn't walking like this. He was like, yo, let's go, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. What's up, man? I'm your back. You know what I mean? He was like, I can't right now, bro. I'll sign it later, bro. Let's go. Don't bother Jesus. He's with me. Right? Like, Zacchaeus was like, yeah, yeah. Hurry. Hurry. Come down. Why are we so anxious? Why are we so fearful? Why are we so worried? Why are we so overwhelmed? Because our life is a culmination of the trees we climb. And eventually you get old enough and you climb enough trees and enough people tell you they're cool that you kind of go, I don't really want to do this anymore. And I think what's happening around the globe is not necessarily all negative. The great resignation could be a setup for us to climb down. I'm down. When's the last time you had a conversation with someone and they're like, man, I've been taking more breaks, man. I don't want to work so many hours. And someone goes, so cool, bro. It's awesome. <laughs> man, I, I don't think making a lot of money is the goal. I'm not into it. You're like, oh, you need to leave LA. You don't fit here. <laughs> you know? Go back to Connecticut, bro. <laughs> Sorry. We're all driven here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just amazing. Like, the most uncool thing to do at coffee with someone in LA is be like, what are you doing for the rest of the day? And you just go, nothing, man. You want to hang? <laughs> and the person's like, no. No, I, I have lots to do. Let's never hang again. I need to be around doers if I'm going to be effective and efficient and really pursue my dreams. You think God's about reaching goals. God's about relationship. But you keep thinking God's like, okay, let's not talk too much about how you're doing. Let's just talk about what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing for me, son? Well, I'm going to fast today, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to go do some evangelism. Good, 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 good. That's real good. Good, good. And we don't even imagine God going, how you doing? What was that? How are you doing? Do you mean what am I doing? No. How are you being? How are you doing? Well, pretty good, I guess. I mean, not great. I still have a lot of more money I want to make. And oh, and God's just like, you, I, can you climb down your tree? Yeah, why? I want to I share a meal with you. Well, then what will we do? Just that. Oh. And would you know, and I'm coming to a close, I really am. Would you know that what changed Zacchaeus' life is one dinner with Jesus? Now, I don't know what you think about Jesus or what you know about Jesus, but we're going to have to go ahead and wrap our arms around this story for a second and just kind of soak it in. This fraudulent man, this deeply flawed, fraudulent man who has made decades of living off of cheating his own people from their money. And it is so known in the Jewish culture that he is no longer accepted amongst his own people. If Zacchaeus wants to share a meal, it won't be with a Jewish man because his own people won't share a meal with him, which was a very intimate act in that culture. He is a reject. He is a train wreck. He is a nightmare. And he likes it. He has dinner with Jesus, and we're not privy to what happens. 
but it is so compelling and so profound and so overwhelming, and Jesus is so wonderful, that this man, evidently over a process of some time at a dinner with undoubtedly all of his employees, all of his trainees, all of the people that admire him, he stands up and dings his glass, and he says, I am a changed man. He says, if I've stolen anything, if, I'm sorry, if, Zacchaeus, if, there's no if here, buddy, I'll give it all back. And he says, no, fourfold what I've, do you know that the law, the Hebrew Bible required the Jewish people to give 10% of their income? And Zacchaeus just said he'd give 400%. People want preachers to preach the law. No, I want you to change 400%, not 10%. The power is not in the law. The power is in the love. That's what transforms your life. But you are so, and I am so determined that these trees are going to save me. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says, hurry, come down from your tree. Do you know where I'm going? And I'll climb it for you. I'll climb the tree. I'll hang from the tree. I'll be lifted up from the earth. I will take your condemnation. I will take your shame. I will take your inadequacy. I will take the feeling and the sensation that you don't belong here and you don't fit in and you're not good enough and you're not smart enough. I will take that. I will take your air. I will take your hatred. I will take your bias. I will take your prejudice. I will take it. I will take it in my body. Come down from your tree and I will climb it for you. And I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And so Jesus climbs a tree not long after this story in a hill called Golgotha. And there he hangs and he cries out in his native tongue, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And of course, the answer, which is one of my favorite A culminating moment in all of Scripture is God rejected his own son so he could accept you. So your worth and your dignity and your renown and your resume would not be based on the trees you climb, but the man who climbed it for you. So your life would no longer be climbing. Your life would be resting in the finished work of Jesus who climbed the tree once and for all. But here we are down here, so worried and anxious and fearful, trying to be the dictator and the leader and the director of our own life, thinking that somehow we bought into that we're in control, that we're in charge, that we understand it all, and if it's going to happen, I'm gonna make it happen, and nothing could be further from the truth of the universe the truth. In control. In control of what exactly? Your birth date, your death date, your heartbeat, your nervous system, your bloodstream. What are you in control of again? Very few things, truly. And yet we keep telling ourselves with our white knuckles clenching the tree as fast as we can and we just... Am I good enough? And the good news is no one is. And that's not how you get in. Come on down. Hurry. You never want me to hurry. I do now. Not one more day stressing. Not one more day striving. Not one more day straining. Not one more orienting your life around reaching goals over relationship with the divine. I want to have dinner with you. I know this might sound strange, but I'm the crazy preacher in life to tell you, next time you have dinner, you should invite Jesus and see what happens. He's invisible now. Not completely, he's in heaven, you can see him, but he's in a spirit form on earth. And so you may not see physical, visible, tangible Jesus at your dinner table. If I did, I, it would not go well for me, so God doesn't do that to me because you can see how emotionally unstable I am. <laughs> Have you ever had a meal and there he is? You just feel him? Texting with friends and all of a sudden, a scripture is shared, a statement, a phrase, and all of a sudden, 
this afternoon, I'm writing. I'm studying my Bible, and I'm like, oh, man, God. this!" And I look down at this little animal that God made, and he's like, isn't it nice? And I look down at this little dog who I think knows his name, but I just think he knows the sound. <laughs> Louis! You know, that's what he hears. He's like, oh, that's me. You know? <laughs> me. But he's sitting in my lap, and I'm like, that's why I got you, little man. Just that's it. We don't really, you, you can't protect me. You can't really do anything for me. You leave a lot of stains around this house, little man. And you're so proud marking every inch of my home, aren't you? Thinking you're... (sighs) He sees his biggest thing is reflections. It's his greatest enemy, reflections. And he's just protecting. And you and I are sitting here tonight going, he's at home right now thinking he's protecting the house. Dad will be home soon. Oh, buddy, I just, I just want you to curl up in my lap. That's about it. And here I'm studying this incredible story, and God's like, do I need to make it any clearer? I just want you to curl up in my lap, man. Are you, you going to protect me, son? You got so many stains on my carpet, man. <laughs> and I just think you're adorable. And you bark at your own reflection. I sure do. I'm done. Can the band come out so, so I'm really done? Do you know there's one other place? You're not, you, you, you're gonna be blown away. There's one other place I found where hurry comes into play. It's gonna blow you away. You need to hurry. I got good news. God hurries sometimes. Did you know that? God hurries sometimes. I didn't know that. So I was reminded of Luke chapter 15 and, um, There's a parable, three parables Jesus tells. You may not know this, but he shares these three stories because he's under incredible criticism, and and, and this is good news. Do you know what they criticized Jesus for? They called him a a friend of sinners. They called him a wine-bibber. They called him a glutton, which means he eats too much, he drinks too much, and he's got friends that aren't good. That sounds like my kind of guy. I'm in love with him. I mean, I'm in love with him. I'm in love with him. And he... um. He says, let me tell you a story. So he tells, he, tells three, he tells three stories and one's about like a coin collection and the other's about sheep and then lambs. And then the last one's about these boys, these sons. And it's one of the great portraits we have of God. He says there was a father with two boys and the older was a, he's, he's the kid that always stuck around, did the right thing, classic firstborn. But the secondborn, he wanted to go, you know, go sow his wild oats and live a little bit. So dad gives him their uh, uh, piece of the pie, gives them their inheritance. And he goes to, you know, I don't know, Vegas or something. And he wastes all his money and he comes back home. And, and um, Jesus is telling the story. And he says, and the father would come out on the porch and he would look for the sun every day, hoping he'd see him in the horizon. Where's my boy? Probably put out word. Anybody, anybody seen my boy? Anybody heard of my boy? Anybody know my boy? You seen him? You hadn't seen him? And um, the day dad came on the porch and he saw the boy, something just overwhelmed him. And the Bible says, Jesus telling the story says, and so the father ran at the son. Now, what you don't know and I don't know is that in those days, any distinguished man of any kind never ran. By the way, I love that tradition. I'm not a big runner. So when Jesus said the father ran in reply to why he hangs out with bad people, Jesus was saying, I run, I hurry to the hurting and the broken. I run towards the fragmented and the sinful. I run to the chief tax collector. I run to the wasteful son. I run to the racist. I run to... He says, the father ran. It gets, it gets, it gets, you're not, I'm telling you, this is the Bible. This is Jesus. And this is the only other time I found in the whole Bible, or at least in the ministry of Jesus, 
When the word hurry came up, Jesus telling the story he wrote, he authored. It's a fictional story, but it's a true story because it reveals the true character of God and why he hangs out with knuckleheads like you and me. He says the son is there in the arms of the father who just ran to hold his boy and why he's holding his son. The father yells to the employees in the house and he says, hurry, get the best clothes I have on the ranch. Get the best clothes in the estate. Get some jewelry. Get some shoes. Hurry. 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 You think God is slow in forgiveness? You think God is slow in covering your weakness and your sin and your shortcoming? You think God wants to shame you or expose you or humiliate you? And so we come with our tails between our legs and we inch our way into church thinking I'll maybe I'll sit in the balcony or the back row because I don't belong here. I'm not moral enough. I'm not godly enough. I don't know enough. I don't read my Bible. This isn't for me. You need to hurry. You need to hurry because God's hurrying for you. You can come down now. You can come down. If I let go of everything that I've identified myself as, am I the only person that sometimes my whole identity is what I've done, what I've done, what I've done, not who I am? I did not come to tell you tonight more of what you need to do. In fact, I have come to tell you tonight my theology informs me to climb down, not up. And you know the gospel is preached when the performance of man is laid down. You think this is about your Bible reading plan? You've lost proportion. You've lost proportion. You am I the only person that studies these ancient theologians and scholars and writers who we have deified and we've made statues of only to discover that they were wrong in a lot of ways? And I think again, wow, God specializes in damaged goods. Are you worn out? Are you exhausted? Are you tired of the rat race? Are you try, tired of keeping up with LA? You tired of the grind? Do you think your career is in your own hands? Your career is no more in your own hands than your birth date was in your own hands. You need to come down. And I urge you, friend, hurry. Hurry. Well, what will I have when I come down? Him, him. What if I never get the job? You'll have him. <clears throat> what if I get a divorce? You'll have him. What if I um? What if I cheated on my taxes and I could, I could face prison time? You'll, you'll have him. What if I decide? to believe in Jesus and my whole family rejects me because I was raised a certain way and if I become a Jesus person, what will I have then, Judah? Him? I wish Zacchaeus was here tonight, don't you? Hey man, what did you see? <laughs> what happened, bro? Did you really give all that money away? I wonder what he would say. And, and, and so I'm going to say what I think Zacchaeus would say just because we're here and like, I know I preached an hour, but I always preach an hour. What'd you see Zacchaeus? Um, it's like, it's his face. Zacchaeus is his face. Oh, man, it's, um, it's his eyes. What do you mean Zacchaeus? Was it how he talked? He listened a lot. What? You should have seen him just look at all of us. 
pouring wine and setting out the food. And he just sat there. He, he's so still, so peaceful, so confident. I, I had never met a man like him. I, I started to talk to some of the ladies at the party and they said they felt so safe around him. And I'll be honest, man, at the party, I just started staring at him. And I thought, I gotta stop staring at him. But every time we'd catch eyes, he'd smile at me in a way that said he knew everything about me. It was just um, having him in my house was like the greatest honor of my life, man. And um, everything changed for me. Yeah, you, like for real, right? You have no idea. My brothers and sisters, I end with this, and I could keep going, but then I'll ugly cry, and then if the pastor like cries, cries, everyone just kind of sits there and goes, should we help him? So we'll stop. You know what I mean? Like when a, when a public speaker's like crying, you're like, oh, that's sweet. And then it's like, <gasps> it's like, oh, okay, this got awkward. So we'll stop right there. Proportion? The Bible's, here's, here's proportion. The Bible says your life here, it's a vapor. Your life here, your life here. Beware of preaching that only prepares you for here. <laughs> we, we, have, we have inverted it. We treat here like it's forever and we treat there like it's brief. We're going home soon, friends. We're going home soon. Come down from the constructs of what makes this so stressful. Let go. And so what we do in this sacred space of worship, what we're doing right now is worship. We're putting our minds together. We're going over his beauty. And what's happening in your heart is a form of worship. What's starting to well up in you is like, I think he is wonderful and I, I think he is beautiful. And something inside of you cries deep calls unto deep. Oh man, whoa, I felt that one. I'm getting weird, right? <laughs> like this guy's getting weird. Whoa. Deep calls unto deep. Don't you take my word for it. You hear me, church? Don't you take my word for it. Don't you dare take my word for it. You let the one that can call into the deepest recesses of your soul meet you there. And if he can't meet you there, then he's not God. So let him call deep into your soul and show you that this is mere, this is more than mere knowledge and an exchange of concepts that there is a resurrection and there is a life and there is a creator and there is the divine and he is wonderful and he is perfect and he is the desire of all nations and he's the treasure we crave and grope for on this earth. Let him call you in the deepest part of your soul. But prepare, my friends, for forever. For that is your home, for you are an eternal being. You're an eternal being having a momentary temporal experience. That's why you don't fit here. That's why nothing is perfect and complete here. Because it's fragmented and broken. It's, we get glimpses of what heaven will be like, but it's not here. So prepare. Come down now. Life is not the collection of things and possessions and recognition and renown and accomplishments. That's not the stuff of life. The stuff of life is romance and love and relationship and connectivity one with another, but ultimately your connection with the divine. And so he reaches and he calls and he beckons and he woos and he dates and he romances you to call you unto himself. But this is where you're home and this is where you belong. You can't be defined by accomplishments and achievements and talents and abilities. You're defined by your eternal state and your soul that was made in the image of God. That's who you are, so come and drink deeply of the wonder of His majesty and His divinity and His sufficiency and His beauty and His magnitude. Don't you settle for mere human temporal experience. There's more. And in the meantime, we'll make the most of the days we have. 
We will serve one another and love one another. And when we falter and when we fail, our Father will pick us up again and say, hurry, cover my son and cover my daughter, for God is in a hurry to cover your sins. You can be forgiven. If I had better news, I would have shared it tonight, but that's all I got. That's the best news I have in the whole wide world, and it's the reason I haven't quit. <laughs> the great resignation has affected me just like it's affected you. And the reason I haven't quit is because the desire of all nations has just captured me, man. I just love him. He brings depth and meaning into the dark night of the soul. He's there. How many more trees are you going to climb, man? Hurry and come down. Jesus, I feel you in this theater tonight. And I love it, man. I love you. You are extraordinary. Perfect in all of your ways. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, He is here. And He is amongst us. And He's walking the highways. Let go, friend. I urge you, hurry and let go. He's here. He's here. He's here. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Wonderful Jesus, Jesus. If you would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus provides, for only Jesus knew no sin, so he could become sin, and to prove that he had the power to take your sin and be the sacrifice for our sin, he died and predicted the third day he would get up from the grave to prove to everyone that he was not a mere teacher or a mere prophet, but he was the resurrection and the life, and he was God with skin and bone on, and he remains God, and he is King, and he is Lord, and he is Chief, and he is director and he is a leader and he is president and he is master and he's your best friend he's the lover of your soul and if you would like to receive him today on the count of three you don't earn it you don't deserve it you don't warrant it you just receive you just receive to believe is to receive to believe is to receive if you would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus offers on the count of three I want you to lift your hand and put it right back down you know who you are one two three if that's you shoot your hand up all over this room God I thank you for all of these hands in this auditorium tonight because I thank you the moment these hands go up, the moment that heart opens, I thank you, you save forever. You save completely. You rescue completely. You forgive completely. You heal and you restore and you cover. There is no one like you. We love you. We are captured by you. You are the wonder of the universe and you are everything we're after and everything we need. If you're willing and able, would you stand to your feet and let's join the band and the singers and the musicians and let's lift our voice together.